Hello everyone at Your Scientist. This is Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan and today I'm here with Sabina Leonelli, Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at Exeter University in the UK. Sabina was my guest on episode number 13 of this podcast. Welcome Sabina. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you again. It's nice to see you again here in Los Angeles today. So over a year ago we met and we talked about the open science movement. This is something that's happening now. So can you give us an update? Where are we a year after? Well, there's been a lot of developments actually in open science. This is something that is being picked up more and more by different national governments, both in Europe, but increasingly also in North America. And uh, it starts to make a headway also in Africa and in Asia. So one place where I think is the most evident that there's been a lot of movement is on open access publishing. Now, this is mostly due to the fact that there is this Plan S, which has been brought out. And this is a very strong push by some of the leading funders of science in the world to try and make it mandatory for researchers to have their work public in an open access format. I'm actually working also within the open um, the Plan S um, group. I'm one of their ambassadors. And um, um, that policy is actually affecting both the ways in which um, national governments and international agencies are dealing with science and assessing it and making recommendations to their grantees, but also it is affecting the ways in which publishers are organizing their work. So, for instance, publishers like uh, Wiley, publishers like Springer Nature are responding to Plan S and starting to adapt their work so that they can actually enter into what they call transformative agreements. So actually have an in-between period when they're trying to shift their publications from a kind of hybrid moment when they're doing both kind of access for payment, you know, like where authors actually pay and access by subscription to a situation where everything will be available uh, free of payment to the reader. So there's been a lot of movement on the open access side. But also we've seen a lot of movement on the open data side. There, there is no compulsory policies yet. Uh, this computing situation is much more complex, but there's been a lot of development on the side of infrastructures that allow you to actually make your data available. And there's much more awareness and much better guidelines around how to make data openly accessible, when is appropriate to do so. And for instance, these principles FAIR, you know, that the the principles which would ask you to make your data findable, accessible, um, interoperable and reusable. Now, these principles have been adopted around the world and they've been very much agreed upon as the way in which we should think about the release of data. So we've seen quite a lot of progress. And how is the open science movement changing research assessment? both at university level or national level? I think that's the million dollar question because uh, that's what will really determine whether researchers can are in a position to pick up open science uh, guidelines and apply them to their work or not. So, so far there's been a very big issue with implementing some of the open access and um, open science and open data mandates, for instance, because making your data available and fair actually requires a lot of extra work by researchers and, and money. it requires and money, money sometimes, yeah. resources and skills that people don't tend to have. And so there needs to be a recognition that this kind of work is in fact very much part of the research agenda rather than being something which you know is just a technical little detail. Um, and partly also because these are decisions about how to manage your data, how to publish that affect the whole design of your research. So researchers really need to be incentivized to think about how to make their work open from the very, very beginning of their um, research trajectory. And of course, also to think about when it is appropriate, whether it is appropriate and under which conditions. So in that sense, there are also interesting movements on research assessment. It's taking, of course, a long time because this really means having both research performing institutions and research funders shift the ways in which they think about research excellence and in which they assess research excellence. And even more importantly, really trying to implement open science and incentivate it means trying to abandon as much as possible 
quantitative metrics. Because quantitative metrics for scientific work tend to not take account of things which actually are qualitative part of scientific work, which is the time and resources that you take in curating your data, which is the type of service and community work that goes into making sure that the models and the software you produce in your research are available, which is you know, the time you actually put into thinking about which publications to pick. And potentially eschew things like uh, impact factors as one of the um, criteria for your choice. I mean, really here we are thinking about disseminating research rather than going to the highest impact factor journal necessary. So it's a very complex requirement to shift research assessment, but we see signs that this is being implemented. For instance, some universities such as Ghent, for instance, in Belgium, have revised their guidelines for promotion to professor and they are trying to implement a much more all-round evaluation of people's profile that includes elements such as their service to the profession, the extent to which they've been behaving in an open science way, and the type of, um, you know, the experience they have had, in, for instance, in curating their data. This is a very important step forward because so far many universities and also many funding bodies have tended to evaluate excellence only by looking at impact factors or some sort of you know, quantitative analysis of publications. And this all-important role attributed to publications tends to put much less emphasis on all these other parts of the open science or the science ecosystem that are absolutely essential to open science. So as long as there is more and more movement by research institutions and by funders towards this kind of assessment, the more it will be possible and um, beneficial for researchers to actually adopt and implement some of the open science guidelines. And since our audience is mainly made of professionals of science, not just researchers, if they would want to be up to date or involved in the conversation on open science, besides it being an important topic at ease of 2020, next July, in Trieste, where is a platform, where is an arena where researchers can actually have a discussion about this? Yeah, so I think um, if you're interested in governance and the issues around uh, what is actually happening in open science uh, around the world, in particular in Europe, then the best place to go is the open science site on the European Commission website, which gives you a lot of information around open science policies, including what they call the open science monitor, which is a tool that allows you to see what is actually going on in different countries, in different environments on open science implementation. In terms of actually uh, getting guidance and uh, getting help on how to perform open science and how to monitor it, Open Air is a wonderful organization that has been now uh, financed by the Commission for several years. And they have assembled one of their main remits is to bring together lots of different tools and resources also coming from other projects for the benefit of researchers that want to get training, help and guidance into implementing open science. Uh, there's something that I had never thought about. Is uh, the open science movement something that started within Europe? Well, no. I mean, the open science movement in many ways has a very, very long history because there's been many different disciplines that have been, in fact, uh, really pushing and trying to make the results available very widely without confines and without paywalls, what we call now paywalls, uh, for centuries, in fact, and that would include uh, places like natural history, astronomy, meteorology. But it is true that in the last 50 years, we've seen... Um, the boundaries of what is accessible in terms of publications within research closing more and more and more, partly because of the way in which the publishing industry has been set up. Uh, industry. The model. Okay. Exactly. And so I think Europe has played a very important role in the last five to ten years in really supporting the open science movement. So what has happened is that this is still something that has come by and large from researchers, but the European Commission and some parts, some of your European nations have been quick to realize that this was something that actually deserved political support and to flank it very strongly. And in fact, it's become one of the pillars of even the previous um, edition, if you want, to the European Commission. So in that sense, Europe has really played a leading role in the last five years in bringing this to the attention of the world and trying to push this um, 
as much as possible. Of course, the UN, also the United Nations, very recently has also um, very strongly supported open science. They've now called it one of their pillars for um, achieving their agenda to 2030. So there's been much wider support than within Europe. And that also comes from many African countries, it comes from many Asian countries, and it comes um, in part at least from uh, North America. South America is again a different situation because there open science has had a very, very long history, particularly in terms of publishing. They've had a really well developed uh, system to actually have most of their publications made available for free. So in a sense, they're much ahead of anybody else, I would say, in the way in which their system has been set up. But in terms of tackling what is now, in a sense, still the core of the scientific publishing industry, which is the US, uh, Europe and China, I think Europe has really um, made a big headway. Well, I thank you very much for your time today. Maybe we can meet again in another year <laughs> for an update on the open science movement. Thank you.